So what varieties am I actually growing this year? I am a food gardener. I am a homesteader. What we do is grow food, and so I am very much about growing food in the garden. Um, I don't consider myself an ornamental gardener, and I don't really consider myself a flower gardener. However, my food gardens are all full of flowers and herbs, and there is a very important reason for that. Um, the, f the first part being that whole grow something lovely idea. Um, I, I believe that when you create a garden that you want to be in because it's beautiful and um, it's not just functional, it's also a creative space that speaks to you, that moves you, that you enjoy. The work of gardening is wearing sometimes. And I, I say this, I, I get fed up with the work of gardening. I get fed up with the failures of gardening. They are inevitable. They're going to happen even to the best gardener. You cannot control all of the factors of a garden, the weather and the, the insects and all of the things that come in out of your control. You're gonna have failures. But for me, creating a beautiful garden that is also just for the sake of my enjoyment rather than the work of and my sustenance. Uh, even when I throw my hands up at the work and I'm just sick and tired of being out there and sweating and getting stung and all of the stuff that happens, what is inevitably gonna happen is I'm gonna wake up the next morning and I'm gonna pour my coffee and I'm going to want to go walk through my garden because it's beautiful and it moves me. So there is an insurance factor in creating a beautiful space. Uh, there is something about a garden that just, um, it is so fulfilling to be in. And so I always say, grow something lovely for that, for, for just for your heart, <laughs> just grow something lovely for your own enjoyment and fulfillment. Put a chair in your garden. Every garden needs a chair because if you only make it a place of work, you'll only go out there when you're working and when you're sick of working, you'll stop going and your garden will fail. But if you also make it a place where you go rest, where you drink your coffee, where you sit in silence, where you watch the butterflies, where you enjoy uh, just the peace and the company of growing things, um, when you throw your hands up at the work, you'll still go back for that. And what will happen when you're there is you'll, you know, pluck a weed and you'll tie up a little, little branch that's hanging low and you'll pick a bug off. And, and, and you'll ease your way back into that work because the line is blurry uh, between the enjoyment and the work in a garden. And so yes, grow something lovely for that. Grow flowers and herbs in your garden. Also, diversity is massively important in any sort of organic growing and in permaculture. When you create a diverse garden space, uh, you're bringing in pollinators, you're bringing in beneficial insects. You're, you're creating a space where, um, some people hate this, but like snakes and garden spiders and frogs are going to come in. You want those guys in your garden. Uh, they are fighting the good fight with you and keeping the, the bad stuff out that's, that's stealing your harvest. Um, and so a diverse space full of flowers and full of herbs and that's planted um, with diversity in mind so you don't have all of one thing all together here, all of one thing one together here. Uh, you know, there's some some mixing going on. It's gonna make organic gardening a lot more obtainable to have diversity. So uh, there is a very practical application for the flowers as well. So I'm gonna jump into flowers first um, and the flowers that I'm growing this year. Now, I mentioned this in a vlog the other day, but I, love um, when things reseed. I love volunteers. Volunteers are plants that grow from seeds you didn't plant. Uh, maybe they came out of a flower head, a bird dropped them, or they fell on the ground the, the year before, or whatever. And to me, uh, volunteers are just, they're so encouraging that seeds want to grow. They, they kind of encourage me that all the weight of the success of the garden is by no means on my shoulders. And also it's just, it's nice. It's free flowers and stuff you didn't have to grow. Sometimes they pop up in places where you have to tear them out or move them. But I like to let volunteers grow when they come up. And being on a new property this year, I don't have any volunteers because I haven't gardened here. In a few years, I'll have a lot because after years of gardening, you get a lot of that. So for this year, I am growing a lot of different varieties of zinnias. 
Um, I like zinnias. They're great cut flowers. The pollinators love them. They're really easy to grow and they do reseed very readily. So some of the varieties of zinnias that I'm growing this year, I'm going to pop them up on the screen. Um, I'm growing the queen lime varieties of zinnias. Um, these are like a really muted antique um, family of flowers. They're uh, the queen lime orange, queen lime red, just the solid lime. Um, and I love them. I like clumping all of those colors together. They're just really breathtaking and beautiful. Another zinnia, and I might be saying this wrong, I'll put the spelling on the screen, is the binaries. Um, and they're like a really giant flower. Uh, zinnias are relative to dahlias, so they're very similar flowers. And so there is another kind called dahlia zinnias and they're just a bigger uh, flower, bigger bloom. All of those I really like. There are lots of different zinnias. Um, there's canary, um, there is like a polar bear one, just lots of different colors. There are a lot of different mixes. Scabo Scabiosa is a mix that I have grown and that I will grow again. I bought lots of zinnia seeds this year all different kinds because I want to just get a wide variety. They grow so simply. You can start them ahead of time or direct sow them and they come up pretty well just being direct sown. And uh, it's just something that fills out really lovely. I think it adds a lot to the garden. And so I'm gonna put a lot of those in my garden. Um, this year, another thing I'm super excited to grow as far as flowers go is that my friend Sunflower Steve uh, came out and visited my farm some weeks ago and he is releasing for the first time ever his uh, sunflowers that he's doing. He He's doing like a fundraiser with them and there's more information about that coming. I'll put a link to his um, mailing list down below so you can find out about that whenever it's released. But he did tell me he was gonna to let me grow some of his seeds and I'm so pumped about that. They're so beautiful. I love sunflowers. Um, that's something that I've always just tucked here and there throughout my garden and grown um, sections of for cutting. This is kind of one of those things that like, if you are only interested in growing food, I still won't say, hey, throw some flowers in your garden for the sake of pollinators, for the sake of creating a beautiful space. But if you are a person that ever buys cut flowers, growing varieties that do well on the table and are good for cutting, it's just really neat to, to, to be able to have that. Um, it, it's one of those things where I see a lot of like monetary value in because I just so love flowers, but I, I don't often bring myself to spending 20 or $25 for a bouquet of flowers um, because I'm just really practical a lot of times when it comes to the grocery budget and that's where that usually comes out of. Um, but for me, being able to go out and get a bouquet of blooms that if I bought it at the store would cost $30, it makes me feel like, wow, I'm getting a lot of value out of my garden. So cutting sunflowers is something uh, that I'll make space for this year. I'm so excited for Steve's flowers, but um, a variety of sunflowers I plan on growing uh, throughout the year. Another uh, really great companion plant that is just really more for the pollinators is borage. Um, it comes in blue and in white and the, the, the flowers are edible. They're real furry, <laughs> just honestly. Like they're a very strange texture. I've seen people freeze them into like ice cubes kind of for the wow effect and the fact that they're not poison, they're not gonna hurt you. Uh, I'm not eating a lot of borage flowers, which is not really my thing. They taste like cucumbers. They are kind of neat. Uh, but but I, I think the bees like the borage more than anything else in the garden. So I like to put that um, as a companion plant throughout the garden. I'll be growing that this year. Nasturtiums. That is an edible flower that I actually really do enjoy. They're very spicy. They have almost like a wasabi kick to them. Um, now, there are trailing nasturtiums. There are varieties that are called like tall or trailing. Um, other nasturtiums grow in a bush habit. So you definitely want to read it and know what you're getting into. So if you're trying to have something like climb up a trellis, uh, you want to make sure it's the right variety for that. But um, a lot of nasturtiums do grow in a bush habit. I've not met a nasturtium I didn't like. I like that several of them are variegated, but I'll grow a variety of those. I don't have any particular one that I'm like, this is my favorite. They can vary a little bit in flavor. Um, I feel like 
when I've had lots of different colors and varieties, I'll taste them and think, oh, they taste a little bit different. But th most of them, they, they've got a little spicy kick. You can eat the leaves and the flowers. And they're really nice in salads. They're really just kind of a beautiful thing for presentation, but also they do have a good kick to them. So they're good on things like fish tacos and things that you might want a little bit of spice. I'm also starting a lot of different Cosmos this year. I think I've bought everything, like every variety that I've come across that I didn't already have. So um, the double click Cosmos, that's what they're called. They're the ones that are like double blossomed. So they're a little fuller. And then the other ones are just single blossomed and they're still really beautiful. Uh, they reseed very readily. And that's kind of my reason for wanting to grow a lot of those this year is because I, I miss flowers just popping up on my farm and, and that's something I want to establish. The last thing that I've got here in front of me that I am uh, restarting this year are the blue, the tie double blue butterfly peas. Um, this is something Baker Creek introduced a few years ago and I started them in my garden and they have reseeded since then. I've saved seeds from them. Um, and this is something that I'm gonna get going here on my farm. Uh, one thing I have not decided yet that I'm going to plant. Um, I planted a lot of morning glories at my old farm and I loved morning glories. And there are some beautiful varieties of morning glory that are variegated, that are so lovely. But then I got a load of compost that had bindweed in it, which is a wild morning glory. And I battled that bindweed so hard. And once you've got it, you never get rid of it. Here, I've already seen that there is bindweed. We had bindweed come up last year, um, just wild by our, by our barn um, shed out there. And bindweed has kind of like made me not want to plant morning glory so we'll just kind of see i'm not planting any morning glory this year and um i don't really have any plans to so that's kind of something that i have talked about planting in the past it's not on my list this year and that's the reason why bindweed burned my little heart against morning glories so those are the flowers that you're really going to see me focusing on this year I am going to do some dahlias. I'm going to do some designated cut flower spaces. Um, we have plans that we would like to, um, over the course of, of getting settled here in South Carolina, like open a coffee shop and do some other things. And I have this idea that I would like to have my own cut flowers in those, in that place. And so I'm going to start kind of focusing on really learning to grow cut flowers well this year. Prior to this, I've really just done it as a companion thing and for my own table. Um, but that's not really what these seeds are for. This is for my own personal garden that I'm talking about today. So herbs, my herb list is long this year because I have nothing. Um, in the past, I, once you get some things established um, in a lot of places, unless you live in a place that's very, very cold, um, in a lot of places, they just automatically come back. Uh, mint, lemon balm, rosemary, chives, dill, all of these things were just established in my old garden. Thyme, marjoram. I hadn't planted a lot of herbs over the last few years because they were just very established. And now... They're not, um, I don't have any of that stuff in a new place. So I'm gonna be establishing spaces with all of those, with all of herbs. I might buy some of those as started plants, just because like I said, I don't have those. I've already started some out in my little garden, but as far as my big garden, I'll probably go ahead and get some started plants. But I did get some seeds for things that are a little harder to find. This has been, look at this, this is holy basil from three different seed companies. This is me being like, I really need this. <laughs> Whenever I look down and I'm like, gosh, I really must have really wanted that. I just keep, I keep buying it from different places. Um, some of these were actually sent to me and then I also bought them. So holy basil is one that's a little harder to find started. Uh, Tulsi is what that's also called. It's a great medicinal herb to have. It's an adaptogen. It's just really supportive of your overall immune health. The pollinators love it. It smells amazing and it reseeds. So once you get it going, a lot of times it's going to come back. And uh, so this is something that I'm definitely going to be very intentionally starting this year and getting started. I am actually building these small round beds um, in my garden because I want to have like a section for mint, um, my lemon balm, catnip. Um, I've got these seeds for like catnip here, 
for lemon balm. Um, it's hilarious to me to have seeds for these because I have had these plants invading my garden for years and then now I don't have them so I'm having to start them again. I'm gonna be a little more intentional with this because the first time that I, that I started a garden, I started mint and lemon balm in a bed and then I just lost that bed to the mint and lemon balm. My friend Jill, who has my old garden now because they bought her old house, now it's Jill's problem. She's dealing with a mint and lemon balm bed and unless she rips all the soil out of there and replaces it, it's just gonna keep coming back. It's very, very invasive. It's just persistent. Like mint is a bully in the garden. Lemon balm is mint's cousin and they just team up together and they took over the whole bed. So I'm gonna do like more intentional spaces uh, with beds that I intend to be dedicated to that forevermore. So I'm gonna have a mint bed, a catnip bed, a lemon balm bed, and just from the beginning seed that and plan on letting it live there. Um, I don't suggest putting those things amongst other beds because they just spread. I learned with my time that it did the same thing. Um, and while I like the benefit of having some companion planting, these things that like really stick around in a warm Southern state, I'm gonna keep those more contained. So uh, next, the things that I'm excited about growing. Uh, let's start with squash because I think that might be my most problematic crop. I have been talking to everybody I can that gardens in this area and I'll ask them like, what is your experience? What do you like to grow? I'm just trying to gather as much information as possible. And the squash, I have been told by so many people, squash bugs are like a real issue here. Now they were a real issue in Arkansas. The way I have combated that, because I will hand pick squash bugs off, um, hand pick their eggs off. I will do neem, I will do diatomaceous earth, but eventually I just lose the fight. And so what I have done in order to be able to get squash is I have just succession sowed it. Um, and I have really been very protective of the winter squash to try to keep everything Thing off of it because it needs so much longer to produce and the summer squash I've almost just let that be the you know the sacrifice of the bugs are gonna get to that and I'll keep them off the winter squash and then I'll just plant more summer squash uh, so that I can keep harvest coming in this year um, I am doing the Rampicante uh, squash which is the long one that grows I love growing that on a trellis um, in my experience, it holds its own pretty well against squash bugs. And they're just so big that like whenever you get one Rampicante, like that's enough to feed my family like two meals worth of squash. And I have a big family. So for me, this has been a good choice to have summer squash. It's really mild flavored, um, but I like it that even when it gets a little bigger, it's still usable. I also, I did, get some of my favorites like uh, the honey nut squash is one i really like um cocazelle is one that i really like and then just some real basic ones that grow super fast like oh is it ron denise is, i'll put it up here if it's a squash i think it's ron denise and then like eight ball is another one or the um the little this is the Gelber englisher custard but there's also they call them patty pans just different ones like that a lot of those are like 40 to 45 day varieties, meaning you put a seed in the soil and 40 days later you were pulling a fruit off of it. They grow super fast during the height of the season. And so for succession sowing in an area where there are a lot of insects, um, I've found those faster varieties are a really good way for me to be able to harvest. And then if the squash bugs come and knock that plant out, I usually have in another section of the garden, I have another set of those plants coming up. And so that way I can keep harvest coming in. Um, that has been the best way for me to deal with those. When people are like, how do I get rid of squash bugs? I don't know if you figure out, tell me because I don't know. Um, I've tried a lot of the suggestions that are out there and I have not won the battle yet. One thing I am doing this year is I did purchase a couple of F1 hybrid summer squashes. And the thing with F1 hybrid seeds is a lot of times they cost more because more human labor goes into producing those because this, the pollen has to be cross-pollinated. And so I did read about um, the benefits of these and these varieties are um, an organic, it's just, it's called Tempest F1 uh, yellow summer squash and then a Butter Baby organic hybrid uh, butternut winter squash and I thought I would give these hybrids a turn because a lot of times F1 hybrids can 
have that hybrid vigor that makes them more resistant to pests, which is why they are so often grown in commercial agriculture because in a business, when the bottom line matters, people are trying to get as much harvest as possible. So I thought I'm willing to try this and see. Um, obviously it's not sustainable if I have to keep buying the seeds and they are expensive seeds. I'm paying more for that winter squash, but if it enables me to grow those squashes at home, um, I would like to do that. That's, this is a, one of the biggest gardening struggles I've had is really successfully growing squashes. And I had this little glimmer of hope, like maybe moving to a new place, it won't be as bad. And like the first thing everybody tells me when I ask about like your biggest gardening struggle, oh, well squash bugs are awful. I'm like, fantastic. I, I went from one highly populated place to another. So that's kind of my squash game plan. You'll notice I don't have a lot of pumpkins planned. I don't have a lot of winter squash planned. That is because I don't have a lot of hope <laughs> as far as like success in those things. Those squashes that the plant has to stay alive and healthy for a hundred plus days. I have struggled so hard in making that happen. So I didn't plan a lot of that this year. If I have success with these things, maybe I can try next year. I'm a Southern girl through and through. I love okra. Um, it's one of these, these plants. It does really well in high heat and high humidity. It thrives on neglect. You can throw it in just about any soil and it's going to grow a pretty decent harvest. The plants might not be a lot to look at, but they will still put off pods. Um, and I just, I love okra. It's something I enjoy eating. I know it's not for everybody. It's got mucilage in it, which makes you kind of like snotty, uh, feeling in your mouth, but it's very good for your gut because of the same reason. Um, I've got multiple varieties here that I'm growing. The Okinawa Pink is one that I really enjoyed. I did get to harvest some of those last year. It was just a really beautiful plant um, and spineless and, and really nice. It grew well. The Alabama Red is one of my all-time favorite okras. It's real squatty. Um, Texas Hill Country is another one. From what I can tell, they're very much the same. I don't know what the difference is, but either or of those, I'm always gonna make space for those because I really like them. And then uh, this year I'm doing the Motherland Oak Grow, which is one that Comfort Farms brought to Baker Creek and introduced that his mother brought from West Africa. So that's one, it's supposed to be really big. And from what I was reading, the leaves are edible, which I have never eaten an okra leaf, but I'm gonna take his word for it and give it a try this year. I suspect okra is going to thrive here in South Carolina. It thrived in Arkansas. It loves heat. Um, and it's just, I love growing okra. So I'm gonna grow a lot of that. That's one of those things like in not preserving food from my garden last year, normally I would bread and freeze a lot of okra and we would eat fried okra like through the winter. And because I didn't preserve last year because we were moving, I haven't eaten okra since last summer. And that's weird for me. Next topic, beans. Um, I got a big stack of bean seeds here. And this is another thing that like, because of not having a garden that I preserved from last year, I haven't had a lot of great fresh beans. I, we eat fresh green beans as they're growing and I typically freeze them. It's not my favorite thing to can, but even that, man, I just haven't had canned green beans in two years. And so I really miss them. Um, so I'm going to be growing Kalima, uh, which is a bush bean that... I really like, it grows a nice thin bean. When you pick them young, they don't have like bad strings in them. They're just like, they stay really tender whenever you pick them, even, even a little bit bigger, they're still really tender and they freeze well, they can well. I really like those. So I'm gonna grow like a few long rows of those bush beans. I'm gonna get some purple potted pole beans going. I am also like the Emirates pole bean. As far as the bean, the texture of it, it reminds me a lot of the Kalima, kind of thinner, uh, more tender. I am not a fan of like the big chunky green beans, you know, that are like super flat and broad. I know a lot of people like those, not my favorite thing. I tend to like a more slender, tender bean. Uh, however, I do grow the Dragon Tongue. That is a wider one. Um, this is a matter of nostalgia for me. Look, see, two different packages, two different seed companies. This is me being like, gotta make sure I have that. The Dragon Tongue Bush Bean is the first heirloom seed I ever bought and grew successfully in my garden. I grew it in my flower beds in front of my house when I lived in town. 
So it's kind of a, it's kind of a thing for me. It's been in every garden that I have ever grown since then. And I always make sure that I grow the dragon tongue. It is really cool looking. It grows really well. It always does. It is like a flat wax bean. So it's that more broader one. Um, and it does turn completely green when you cook it. So it's neat looking when it's growing, but pretty plain when you cook it, but they taste good. Um, I also am going to be establishing noodle beans. I've got red noodle beans. I've got green noodle beans. Um, they're different. I do not consider those to be the same thing as green beans because the noodle beans are an Asian bean that you don't cook the same. They're not, like if you boil them, they get kind of like squashy and waterlogged. Um, they're more for stir frying and I like them stir fried. So the way I take them, they're real long and I'll cut them into like segments, like bite sized segments and put some oil and some garlic in like a cast iron pan or a wok and cook those uh, for just a couple of minutes, you know, until they soften and they kind of squeak when you bite them. Um, they're a different thing. So th for the people who grow noodle beans thinking they're getting like green beans that they're gonna like cook down with some bacon and boil and all that, not the same thing. You're, you're looking at more Asian dishes with those noodle beans. They're also pretty cool pickled. Um, but they're beautiful growing. It's one of those things that just takes your breath away and you go in and you see a trellis with noodle beans hanging down. There are gonna be some things that I don't cover in this video. I'm gonna grow watermelons this year, but I'm gonna try multiple varieties and figure out what works best here. I never had a watermelon that I was like married to. I've tried lots of different things and had equal success with all of them. Quite a few things. There will probably be a lot of things like that that I don't talk about, but this is the stuff I'm just really excited about. Uh, cucumbers, I have two, well, three, I guess you could say three. Three cucumbers that I am like, really like, we are in a committed relationship. Uh, the first one is the Mexican sour gherkin, mouse melon, cucamelon, if you will, all of these things, they're called that. That This is not the most versatile plant. You're not going to like, uh, preserve these and feed your family for the year off of Mexican sour gherkins. In fact, I would not suggest that you plant more than a handful of plants of these, but you can plant two or three plants on each side of an arch trellis and they will completely take a while to get started. Um, I do suggest this is one cucumber. I do suggest starting indoors before uh, because they can take a while and in germinating slowly if they get eaten by something and you have to re sow. It just can be frustrating to get these going. They do best started indoors. But I just think they're so beautiful. The novelty of them, um, I just love having them in my garden. And so, yeah, I'll always grow these, even though. I, they're cute for fridge pickles. You don't want to process them and try to preserve them that way because they turn to mush whenever they're cooked. Um, but for fridge pickles, it, they're just adorable and a little charcuterie spread, tiny little, they look like baby little watermelons, but they're also just cool to snack on in the garden. My kids like snacking on them. Uh, the next one is not a cucumber. That's why I hesitated when I said three. Baker Creek calls it a cucumber here, but they say on the back, it's technically a melon genetically. Um, the Armenian yard long. This is used like a cucumber when it's harvested young. When it's harvested small, they're about this big. This, the skin is still really thin. You can make pickles out of them. You can cut them up and put them in a salad. Um, just use it like any cucumber and they're delicious. They're so mild. Their skin is not bitter. I love them, especially if you're growing in a place that's hot where cucumbers can get real bitter. This melon is not going to do that to you. However, I discovered on accident by letting it get really big. I had one that kind of got away from me in my garden and got massive and the skin got hard and the seeds got big and it was very obviously a melon when I broke it open. But I thought, well, is it useless? And so I tasted it and it's really mild. It's not super sweet. It's slightly sweet and slightly cucumberish as a melon, but you can, I mean, it's a ton of food. It's like a four or five pound melon, you know, when it gets really big and you can scoop that flesh out. It's the texture of melon flesh and blend it with some Greek yogurt and some honey or strawberries or whatever and put it in popsicle molds and freeze that and have a really good refreshing popsicle and I made those for my kids and 
that made the Armenian white so much more valuable to me because the problem is with a cucumber, if it gets away from you and it gets really big, there's no, you know, if you, the chickens or the pig because it's so bitter and the seeds are so big and it's just not nearly as useful. But if you've got this growing and it gets away from you and you've got like a really big fruit, it's still useful. So I like that. I will always grow that. Um, and the last, this is my cucumber love. Silver Slicer. I got these from Hudson Valley. I don't know if, for a while that was the only place that I knew of that had them. I think they're starting to spread out. Other companies are getting them, but I love Hudson Valley. Um, the Silver Slicer Cucumber. There, It has like a, there's the salt and pepper also, which is supposed to be like the pickling version of the silver slicer and i grew it last year and really liked it too but the cool thing about the silver slicer is you can harvest it young and it's firm enough to stand up to being pickled or you can let it get larger like slicer size and even then it's still firm enough to to stand to being pickled but it's juicier and it's more like a slicer this is my favorite cucumber. I just love it. I sing its praises every year. I actually have not picked out like a classic green pickling cucumber or a slicer cucumber to grow this year. Um, maybe I should. I might change my mind on that. But I am so in love with the silver slicer that I don't feel like I need it. I just see it does so well. It doesn't get bitter. It produces like crazy. It has, I've grown it three years now and it has outproduced every other cucumber and done so much better. So I, I love that cucumber so much. Um, let's see, what else do I have in front of me? Peppers. Oh, peppers. Do you know that I missed tomatoes last year, but I think I missed peppers just as much as tomatoes um, because we moved right as the peppers started to grow. So I did get to eat tomatoes last year, but hardly any peppers. We had some friends here bring us some from their garden when we moved. This year I'm going, fairly basic on my pepper selections. I've got multiple packages here of the shishito, which is the pepper that I longed for the most last year. Um, it just, the shishito pepper is like life changing. You just blister them in a pan, poke holes in them first so they don't explode in your face, but blister them in a pan and then make like an aioli with mayo, I, my mouth is watering, with mayo and garlic and like lemon juice or lime juice, maybe some cayenne in there and stir that up and dip those blistered peppers in that aioli and it is life changing. It is so good. Gosh, I miss those peppers. Look, seriously, this is four packages. This is excessive. This is, this is how you know I miss something when I have like multiple packages of it that I have brought out and then I'm like, don't forget to start this. So that one is high on the list. Um, I hate doing lots of jalapenos because I did not can anything last year. So I'm used to having canned candied jalapenos, canned pickled jalapenos, um, freeze dried jalapenos. I do still have some of those, but I've been kind of stingy with them, um, because I wanted to make sure that they last. Um, I'm, so I'm going to grow a lot of those Craig's Grande is like my tried and true. These grows massive peppers. They're great for stuffing and they just do really well. So that's kind of my go-to for a jalapeno, but I'm also doing the orange spice. I like the pumpkin spice, the lemon spice, all of those. I also do the jalapeno, which is the ones that aren't spicy. I plant those far away so I can differentiate and to, to be able to keep them from cross-pollinating so I can save the seeds. These are really good for like making stuffed peppers and stuff for people that don't like spicy. So that's kind of why I grow those. Um, serranos. Another pretty basic semi-hot pepper. Um, they're hot to me. I don't like super spicy stuff and nobody in my family really likes super spicy stuff. So serranos, habaneros, and the sugarish peach. That's about as hot as I go and I use those in cookie cooking and adding in to make salsa. So all those are on my list. The habanada is on my list. That's kind of, it's a habanero that doesn't have heat to it. So again, for cooking and I just like eating those fresh. It looks like I probably need to go through my seeds. Um, I don't have anything out here for bell peppers. I'll definitely grow bell peppers. Um, I do have this Lesia, which is, I'm assuming, kind of like a bell pepper. This one's new to me. I think I started it last year, but moved before I harvested any of them. But sweetest of all peppers with the thickest flesh we've seen. So that like really called out to me. Peppers are 
Um, they're difficult for people who live in shorter seasons. So even for people who live in longer seasons, I mean, I live in a long season hot place um, before I moved and after. But I start my peppers in February, six weeks before our last frost. But I do not move my pepper plants out until about four weeks after my last frost. So you don't want to move your pepper plants out as soon as there's no chance of it dropping below 32 Fahrenheit or zero Celsius. You wanna wait until they're not even going to have to endure a like semi cool night. You wanna make sure that it is that it is not dropping below like 50 Fahrenheit, which I think is like 10 Celsius. You definitely wanna make sure that it's going to be not cold at night before you move your peppers out and you will get a better harvest because cool nights like stunt them forever. They never do right if they have to endure really cool nights. Now I've got a whole pile of seeds right here that I'm not even talking about. Right now is time for me and my mild wintered place to start the seeds for lettuce, for kale, for cabbages, um, rutabagas, beets, cauliflower, broccoli, all of that stuff. Um, if you are trying to grow an early spring harvest of something cool, you want to get those seeds started in a controlled temperature place uh, to put out four to six weeks before your last frost. And I'm not even talking about that stuff right now because I don't have anywhere to start those seeds. I don't have a greenhouse. I don't have any space inside my house. So if this was a normal situation, I'd be starting all that stuff right now. Um, I have it. I'm probably going to direct sow some in my little garden beds outside my house, but I'm probably just not going to grow a lot of that stuff this spring because we're just not ready. Uh, so when I'm talking about all the summer garden things, don't forget, like you can grow before the summer garden starts in a lot of places. Even if you live in a place that's very cold right now, um, you could be starting stuff soonish to move out four to six weeks before your last frost date. And even if you have to throw a sheet over it, if you're going to get some really cold weather, uh, you can grow a lot of stuff outside. Now, the last thing. Well, I guess two last things because I kind of lumped them together. I do have ground cherries, um, Aunt Molly's, pineapple. Uh, there are a few varieties of ground cherries. I've found them all to be pretty interchangeable. They all seem about the same to me. So I've got some Aunt Molly seeds right here. Uh, I have some pineapple seeds also just not out here. And I'm going to start some of all of those and get those going. That's another thing that once you get those going in your garden, they'll reseed forever. You'll just find those volunteering forever. So that's something I want to get started this year. We love ground cherries. They're kind of like a cherry to tomato version of a tomatillo. And they're really sweet. We call them garden candy. And lastly, my beloved tomatoes, which I have missed so much. Um, I will probably do a separate video about tomato varieties when it comes down to it. Because right here in front of me, I have probably about 60 different varieties of tomatoes and I have more seeds that I have ordered that have not come here yet. So that's a lot. And I am mostly growing things that I have grown in the past with success. I am actually not doing a, I think I have like three new to me varieties this year. Um, so I'm just gonna to jump on the main ones that I grow and have grown and are my staples that I really miss. Uh, the first one is Paul Robeson. This is one of my most favorite tomatoes of all time. It is like a really rich, smoky, deep flavor. Um, and it, it's kind of between like medium and large size. I think like probably eight to 12 ounces is pretty typical of this tomato. And it's just a beautiful heirloom tomato. It does really well for me. I really love it. The next one is, I mispronounced this. That has been established, but I don't know how to go back and change it. I say Dr. Witchies. I think it's Weish or Weich. The problem is, is people have corrected me, but then I've had like four different people correct me and tell me different pronunciations. So I've just stuck with Witchies. Um, either way, big, lovely yellow tomato. It's very similar to Kellogg's Breakfast. I think they might be kind of the same thing. Um, and both of those, I grow both of them. Um, 
and they are both very lovely. I like having a variety of different tomatoes, different colored tomatoes that can have such a different flavor. They can be mild and fruity. They can be deep and rich with like rich umami flavor. And my favorite thing to do in the summer is to take uh, you know, three or four different colors and flavors of tomatoes and slice them really thin and stack up all different colors with some bacon on some thick white bread with good mayonnaise and have a tomato bacon sandwich. Black Beauty is another one that I'm definitely looking forward to this year. These are all tomatoes I didn't really get to experience last year. The Thorburns Terracotta Tomato is one I'm really looking forward to that I miss. And there are a lot of varieties. I think most of my favorite cherry tomato varieties came from Wild Boar Farm. Um, Brad Gates developed these really neat cherry tomatoes. And um, like the blue cream berries, uh, the blueberries, or blue boar berries. Pink Berkeley tie-dye, that's one that originated with Brad. That's a bigger tomato. Berry's Crazy Cherry. All of these are like my favorites. I just love having those in the garden. They do so well for me. And those are ones that I'll grow. As well as Brad's Atomic Grape, which people either love or hate, but I always grow it. It's my daughter's favorite tomato, so I have make space for it. I've got seeds for it, and I'll be growing that for her this year. There are two varieties of tomatoes that are new to me this year. I think these are the only two. No, there's three um, that I got new seeds for to try that I've never tried. I got the watermelon beef steak, which is a new one that Baker Creek shared. The black strawberry which is a new one, and one called Indigo Kumquat, which is an F1 hybrid I got from Johnny's. And then I did get one more F1 hybrid from Johnny's called Torangina, which is supposed to be heat resistant. So those were ones that I, there were specific reasons either I thought that looks really cool, that looks really delicious, or I think that'll do really well in my garden. For the most part though, I'm really trying to stick with what I know works since I am in a new place. And if there's failure, I need to know why. And if it's a new variety, how can I accurately say, well, this failed because it's a new variety and I've done everything the same as all these others. Like I needed to kind of have a baseline. So I, I said that was the last thing. It wasn't the last thing. Um, I, I didn't see these sticking underneath there. So I haven't purchased just a ton of melon seeds. Like I said, watermelons, I'll probably try a variety of things. But I did get two small melons. The Kajari melon, I had to bring that one back. That's an old favorite, and I need to see how it does here. As well as the Kiku chrysanthemum melon. This melon did not wow me. Um, it's real mild. The, um, the, the description on it says that it is a creamy melon that tastes like Greek yogurt. And when I first read that, I, I, I first grew this melon because of that description. I was like, I really want to try that. Um, but my son Benjamin loves this because we used to pick these. They're like this big. They're like maybe baseball size. And we would pick it and we would whack it on the side of the garden bed and break it open and then just eat out of the middle of it. Um, and we called them Mowgli melons because it reminded us of the Jungle Book. And that is one of Benjamin's favorite garden memories and he brings it up and he's like, are you growing the Mowgli melons again? And so I literally just bought these because it gives my son a great garden memory. Not because they're exceptionally good. <laughs> He likes them. I mean, they're okay. And the last thing is eggplants. I didn't mention a lot of eggplants. I usually end up grabbing a few like started plants of these. I just don't grow a ton of eggplants. Uh, they're hard to preserve. You can preserve them. There, I've, I've tried a recipe for, for, for preserving like a ratatouille mix, but it has to be pressure canned. Uh, so there's just a little more work to preserve them. If you've got any great recipes pr for preserving eggplant, I would love to hear them because that's something that I've not really ever solved in a way that I felt great about. But I did get some packages for just some plain black beauty. That's my favorite eggplant, just like a real basic uh, one. And I, I like eggplant. I like cooking it. Um, either with like doing eggplant parmesan or there's this one way I've cooked it before where you like layer it with heavy cream and parmesan and you just like slow cook it with a lot of thyme and stuff and it kind of cooks down. It's really good. Um, but you know, I sometimes will get a few started plants of other kinds and, and grow those, but that's not something that I do a ton of because I don't have a good preservation method. So I don't want to be overwhelmed with something I can't use. So those are my seeds.
I feel like I've been talking for a year, so I'm gonna wrap this up. I'm sure there are things that I will end up growing that I did not mention here. I have not even dug into some of the seeds that I have saved um, and all the seeds that I moved. There's still a lot that I have to get into that I will probably add to this, but again, in my garden this year, I'm really focusing on what I know works. So there may be some obscure things I might have grown and liked that I don't grow this year. The beautiful thing about the garden, and I do want to remind you guys of this, because I think that sometimes we can imagine a pressure when we are planning our garden to get it exactly right, uh, to make sure that we grow those things or else we'll miss out and, and different things. And while, yes, I mean, like right now I'm saying, hey, I've missed this stuff. I didn't get to eat it last year, so it's been two years since I've eaten some of this stuff by the time I get it, and I, I want it. But there is always next year, so, don't fall prey to like a frenzy or an idea that you've got to absolutely get it right or you know like doom will fall on you. It's just you know you might miss out on something and be more motivated to grow it the next year. Um, and that's kind of the stance I'm taking in growing my garden this year because so many factors are new. I miss this stuff. I want to try to get it. I want to do my best to establish that. But it's kind of, I'm kind of waiting on some of the experimenting for the next garden year because this is a lot already to be getting on with and figuring out how to garden in a new place. It's a lot already. <laughs> if you are still here at the end of this very long video full of conversation about seeds, thank you. And I hope that you, you feel the kindred spirit in me uh, that I love this. It's a valid passion and I'm so glad that there are the people who have cared about this enough that I get to sit here and talk to it, to you about it because this represents so much stewardship that we have access to all of these varieties. Um, each one of these varieties and each one of these things represents a person, a gardener that cared like we care. So thank you guys for hanging out with me today. Happy growing. I bless you. Until next time.